Welcome back to the Biochemistry for Health Sciences channel. In today's video, we shall look at the applications of uh, isoelectric point in biomedical sciences. In a previous video, we discussed how you can determine the isoelectric point of a protein one way is by calculation and that requires that we know all the pKs of the ionizable groups in the protein. The second way of determining the isoelectric point is by a technique called isoelectric focusing or IEF. So basically by running a number of standard proteins and then comparing the unknown with the standard protein, we can determine the isoelectric point of an unknown protein. Proteins that have more basic amino acids, especially lysine and arginine, because these groups have amines. So these proteins that have more of these basic amino acids, they tend to have a higher PI, a higher PI, and these are called basic proteins. So in your body around pH 7 to 7.4, these proteins will have a net positive charge. That means the number of positive charges in the protein at pH 7.4, and remember positive charges come mainly from amine groups, compared to the number of ne negative charges. Negative charges mostly come from carboxyls, although they can come from many other groups. So basically the number of positive charges outnumber the number of negative charges, and that gives the protein a basic or positive charge with a higher PI. Now, if the protein had more carboxyls, and that comes from these two amino acids, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, because of this R group carboxyls. So if the protein has a lot of these amino acids compared to the basic amino acids, then they would tend to have a net negative charge at pH 7.4. These are called acidic proteins. So in the body, in our body, acidic proteins are more common, more common than basic proteins. Basic proteins are less common in the human body. Before we look at the applications of uh, PI in, in the clinical setting, uh, this is an important concept to understand. Uh, when the pH of the medium is less than the PI of the protein, then the protein tends to have a net positive charge, as we mentioned. And in this case, as you can see, the proteins have a lot of positive charges. Of course, positive charges will repel one another and the protein is more soluble. Similarly, when the pH is greater than PI, so remember now the carboxyl groups will be COO minus, or your amine groups will be unprotonated NH2, which have a zero charge. So because of a lot of negative charges now, once again, there is repelling and the protein is also more soluble. So the protein is soluble when the pH is less than PI or when the pH is greater than PI. But when the pH is close to the PI, then the net charge is close to zero. So the number of positive and negative charges in the protein is equal and the net charge is zero. In this case, the protein solubility in water or in aqueous solutions like blood or in the cell cytoplasm will tend to go down dramatically. So proteins are least soluble at their isoelectric point or PI. 
This concept is actually used to make cottage cheese. So casein has a PI of 4.6. Casein is the major protein found in milk. So when the food manufacturers try to make cottage cheese, what they do is they add acid. Milk is around 6.6 .6 pH. Um, <clears throat> has a pH around 6.6. .6. So by adding a bit of acid, it brings the pH down to close to 4.6. And that makes the casein very insoluble. And the casein basically precipitates out and helps in the manufacture of cottage cheese. Okay, so let's look at a few important applications of PI uh, in the biomedical sciences. Okay, basic number one, basic proteins may stick to cells. So cells have a net negative charge, whether it's epithelial cell or the red blood cell, cell membranes tend to have negative charges. Okay, and this is one reason why the red blood cell doesn't stick to another red blood cell easily, or why the red blood cell doesn't stick to uh, the epithelial cell, the endothelial cell in the bloodstream, for example. Okay, so if, if this was your blood, because the charges on cell surfaces are, have, are negative. So if you had a small molecule that had a positive charge uh, that may get attracted, but it won't stick very well because remember these positive negative charges, what we call electrostatic charges, these are weak forces. It's a weak force. And remember everything is moving around in your bloodstream, in your cytoplasm and so on. So weak forces, we have one positive and one negative is not going to be strong enough to stay attracted if you it be broken very easily however if you had a macromolecule macromolecule such as a protein or for example now this is a lot of interest in nanomolecules that is used for <clears throat> as, as drugs drug delivery systems these nanomolecules or macromolecules may have many positive charges and these positive charges that you see in proteins will cause better sticking to the cell membranes. So macromolecules or proteins that have a lot of positive charges, these are basic proteins, they will tend to stick to cells better than those macromolecules that have negative charges. Actually, we know that uh, there are nanomolecules that have a lot of positive charges, a high positive charge density on their surface. They can actually get so quickly attracted to the uh, red blood cell or any other cells, and they, they basically will come stick around this cell membrane, and they can even make holes. They can even make uh, puncture holes in the in the red blood cell, for example, and and that can lead to cell lysis. Can actually break cells if the if the positive charge density is very very high. So in general, the presence of more positive charges in a macromolecule such as a protein will tend to have the protein stick to the cell surface better. And because protein is a large molecule, the cell is going to take the protein in by endocytosis. So the presence of positive charges on the protein will help in the endocytosis of proteins or of other macromolecules. However, however as we mentioned, if you have too many positive charges, that can really lead to uh, actual breakage or lysis of the cell. Uh, a lot of uh, cytokines uh, and growth factors, they, they tend to have uh, 
uh, quite high PIs, many of them. Some have uh, less than seven, but quite a few of them have PIs, say around eight or so. So they have a net, uh, slightly net positive charge like this. So it's not surprising that many of these uh, cytokines are actually attracted to the uh, outside of cells where there are a lot of negatively charged uh, surfaces. So this is a kind of a storage for cytokines. So the extracellular space tends to be a storage site for cytokines because of this attraction between the neck, the uh, positively charged cytokines and the negatively charged uh, membrane surfaces as well as a lot of extracellular matrix that has ne a lot of negative charges. So basically the take home message is the more positive charges you have on a protein or a macromolecule, the better the chances that it will stick to cells. Now cytochrome C is a very important protein in the electron transport chain that will be discussed in future videos when we talk about metabolism. Um, electron transport chain happens in the inner mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, which is also negatively charged. It's also negatively charged. And cytochrome C has a very high PI. So it's a basic protein, very high PI. That means cytochrome C has a lot more positive charges compared to negative charges. And this property of cytochrome C tends to help its function because the cytochrome C can actually stick to the inner mitochondrial membrane by electrostatic means and, and travel in the inner mitochondrial membrane to help it carry out its uh, very important function of electron transport in the electron transport chain. So here's one another application of the importance of PI uh, in the function of this protein called cytochrome C. Histones or in major permitted proteins have also very high PIs. So these are again basic proteins, basic proteins. And because of their very high PI, you can see the histone with a very high PI gets attracted to the DNA. Remember, DNA has negatively phosphates, negatively charged phosphate groups on the backbone. So you can see all these phosphates here that are negatively charged. And histones are positively charged. They have a lot of positive charges because of amino acids such as arginine and lysine. And so this DNA gets attracted to the histone and gets compacted by this interaction. So once again, the high PI of proteins such as histones and proteins help in their function in binding DNA, condensing DNA, and then regulating access to the DNA information. In other words, regulating gene expression. Another protein, basic protein, is called myelin basic protein or MBP. And that too has a very high PI. MBP makes up about 20% of myelin in the central as well as peripheral nervous system. And it plays a very important role in the formation and stabilization of the myelin sheet uh, in these uh, neurons. So once again, because of its uh, high positive charge due to the abundant lysine residues, it interacts with the myelin lipids 
by electrostatic as well as hydrophobic interactions. And you can see the myelin basic protein together with other proteins help form what we call the myelin sheet in these neurons that are myelinated. The measurement of myelin basic protein is important in the um, uh, in various neurodegenerative diseases because in these diseases there is increased breakdown of myelin and if we could, if we detect this protein in CSF that gives us uh, an, an indication of a myelin breakdown that's happening in these diseases. So once again, the concept of a basic protein, a lot of positive charges in myelin basic protein that interacts with the negative charges of the lipids and help in making of the myelin sheet. Another important application of PI is in insulin drugs. So before we talk about these drugs, let's look at a little bit about the secretion of insulin. So after a meal, when our blood glucose concentration is very high, this glucose will enter from the blood into the beta pancreatic cell. Okay, so this is a beta cell in the pancreas and glucose will serve as a trigger to this mechanism. It will serve as a signal which will cause the increased concentration of calcium in the beta cell. And this calcium then stimulates the fusion of these vesicles where insulin is stored. Insulin is stored as an aggregate of six insulin molecules or hexama in association with zinc ions. So this insulin that is found in these vesicles in the presence of high intracellular calcium, these vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and the insulin is secreted and comes out into the bloodstream. So initially, the insulin rapidly rises in your blood and then starts going down in about five to 10 minutes, insulin levels. And once this, all these vesicles have fused, you see the peak in insulin and then more insulin is made. So after about 30 minutes or so, new insulin is synthesized and is then packaged into the vesicles. And then again, gradually the insulin levels the newly made insulin levels start rising and gradually goes down as your blood glucose goes down. And so you see this uh, biphasic, biphasic release of insulin. So the first phase here, which is sudden within 10 minutes and then after 30 minutes or so, we see this second phase. So that's how basically insulin is secreted. Uh, after having a meal. So we have, uh, there are quite a few different types of insulin injections. Uh, insulin is injected usually subcutaneously. Uh, we have the short acting insulin, which works for about seven hours. And then we have a intermediate acting insulin and that works for almost 15 hours in the body. And how this is made is interesting, uses the concept of uh, PI. Insulin has a PI, you can see it's an acidic protein, PI 5.4. If we mix that with protamine, which has a very high PI, 13.8. So basically you can see the net negative charges on insulin will interact with that large number of positive charges on the protamine and you get this complex of negative and positive and negative and positive forming this very large complex okay which will 
stay in the uh, under the skin the subcutaneous point of injection and these complexes will slowly dissociate slowly break down into monomeric insulin and this monomeric insulin enters the blood and carries out its function for 15 hours so that's the trick of making in one of the tricks of making intermediate acting insulin is by mixing uh, acidic insulin with a basic protein such as protamine forming poorly soluble complexes, these big aggregates, electrostatic aggregates, that then slowly break down to give you monomeric insulin. Then we have long acting insulin and this works for almost one day. And one of the tricks used to make this long acting insulin is to actually modify the insulin by adding additional lysines to the insulin. Remember, lysine has a very high PI. So what happens, now the insulin PI changes from 5.4 to 6.7. Okay, remember the pH of the blood and the cells is around 7, 7.4. So now 6.7 is closer to 7. So the solubility, because it's, the pH is now close to the PI, so now the solubility of this insulin goes down. And it, this insulin then forms little, little precipitates once it's injected. And these precipitates very gradually break down and dissolves over a period of 24 hours. So that's a uh, very nice trick of uh, making a long acting insulin. Another application of uh, PI uh, is with uh, antibodies. Okay, so remember our antibodies, and we'll discuss this in a future video. Uh, these antibodies are basically formed by recombination of, of various genes. And so the type of antibodies we get is really a mixture, a mixture of all kinds of proteins, okay, which act as antibodies. So in electrophoresis, this mixture usually exists in what we call the gamma globulin the gamma, gamma globulin region of our electrophoresis pattern. This is where you see IgA, IgG, M, D, and so on. Now, antibodies have a very uh, high range of PI. Okay, so some antibodies may have a PI around six, okay, some seven, some eight, some nine, and so on, because they are very, very diverse. Um, Nowadays, antibodies are used as drugs. Herceptin is a, is a great example of the use of an uh, antibody as a drug. This is used for breast cancer. Many of these antibodies that are made today, uh, the manufacturer prefers that it has a high PI. So in case of Herceptin, the PI is 8.7. Uh, because the uh, cell surfaces and this receptor for Herceptin, which is EHER2, this PI is around 6. So you can see this is basically has more net negative charges. This tends to have more positive charges. So this will help the antibody bind its receptor by electrostatic. Okay, so the changes of the antibody binding to a cell surface. So the antibody binding to a negatively, char negatively charged cell surface is better if the PI of the antibody is slightly on the positive side, more than seven, since cell surfaces are negatively charged. And a lot of this, uh, in this example, the uh, receptor for Herceptin is also negatively charged. So once again, PI, uh, by changing the, the amino acids in the um, drug, we can increase the PI of the drug and increase its success in binding to the receptor or to cells. 
So this is a, a few examples of the importance uh, of the isoelectric point of proteins. Okay, isoelectric points of proteins, not only in uh, uh, physiology and anatomy, but also in uh, pharmacology as well as pathophysiology. Okay, thank you for joining us and until next time, uh, wish you a very wonderful day and hopefully we'll see you soon in our next video.